My name is Gary Gordon, and I'm the founder of What Should I Be? And we're here today with Stephanie Burek, and we're going to talk about what she's doing with her life. And we will begin our interview by uh, letting her introduce herself as, uh, wh what are you doing now? Let's start with that, and then we'll, we'll jump backwards in a little bit. Well, literally right now, I'm the instructional design specialist at Harper College, which is actually the first community college in the United States. It was the brainchild of um, some founder at University of Chicago, like a president or something. And um, that's what I do by day. And then by night and weekend, I do um, website development and marketing for my own company. Okay. That's pretty cool. So let's take... Uh uh, a step back to one of your earlier, uh, I guess, employment uh, jobs that you had done, uh, which was involving, I think, uh, a mu in the museum field. Yeah. Um, was that one of your first things out of school or was Yeah, that was actually my first job with benefits. <laughs> that was your <laughs> first job? Me holding up my uh, paycheck with the, you know, health insurance benefits marked on the bottom. <laughs> Now, was that something that you wanted to do for a long time, or was it something you fell into? Yeah, that's actually what I went to school for. My undergrad was in art history, and uh, my graduate degree was in museum education because I knew that I wanted to teach, but I didn't want the politics of a public school system. And uh, the cool thing about teaching in a museum is you really don't have many limitations, and it's all about... Um, teaching and having fun and, and learning while doing um, rather than, you know, having to look at worksheets and books and uh, homework and things like that. So what was the title of that position that you had stepped into after school? At uh, Auburn University where I was working, it was the um, Jewel Collins Smith Museum of Fine Art. They call it the Curator of Education. Other museums will call it um, just a museum educator or director of education. Okay. And before we start talking about what that job entails and what it is, um, what was it back when you were, let's say, before you went to school, before you went to college and on, on that path, um, what was it in your earlier years that gave you an indication that this was something you wanted to do? Well, um, when I was six years old, I started saving all the worksheets that I really liked in school and putting them in a little box because I figured adults seem to forget what it's like to be a kid. And so I wanted to remember, so I saved all of my favorite things so that when I was an adult, I'd know what kids liked. Um, I just loved uh, being a mentor and, and sharing knowledge and learning myself. And so... I was one of those kids who loved school, you know, loved learning everything. And in college, it was actually kind of hard to decide what I wanted my major to be because I liked everything I was studying. Um, and so to pick one thing to have to do for the rest of my life seemed a bit daunting. But, um, you know, it, it occurred to me I was teaching Sunday school it, during high school and college, and um, all of my jobs that I had gotten was were babysitting and, um, you know, tutoring and things that involved teaching or working with individuals. So I figured that was a good direction to go in. Okay. Um, when you were uh, in high school thinking about, like, what college to go to and what to major in, what were, what were you doing at that point? In other words, when you made your decision on which college to go to, how did you decide and what did you declare a major immediately or did you wait? What was that process like? Well, I felt pressure to to say that I was declaring a major. I think I picked comparative um, comparative literature actually because uh, I loved my English class, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I picked colleges just basically they had to show up on that um, U.S. News and World Report list of top 50 colleges. And so the truth is I went to Boston University and that was not the top 25. It was like number 50 or something. And I had gotten into one of the top 25. And so I really wanted to go there. It was Washington University in St. Louis. 
and it looks like a castle. So it's really <laughs> a beautiful place to go to school. But um, it was about money. And uh, BU had a really great scholarship program. And I got a lot of, you know, support from Boston and Washington University. I was also going to get scholarship money, but it was going to be a little bit different. So, um, and my parents, they knew that I was the type of person that likes to be around a lot of people and learn about cultures and and just have a lot of different unique experiences in Boston, being on the East Coast near all those other major cities and, um, you know, hundreds of colleges in a very small area is really one of the best places, I think, to go to school if you're an outgoing kind of a person or even if you're not, but you like to people watch or you like to see a lot of action. St. Louis wasn't quite as exciting when you think of it in those terms, you know. So, so you lived in St. Louis. No, I, I lived in Chicago, but um, St. Louis is where uh, Washington University is located. Oh, oh okay. okay. And so it would have been a matter of going to St. Louis or Boston. and. Okay. Yeah. So you were over in Chicago and you then went over to Boston. Okay, and I, you lived there and so forth. So do you feel that even though the college wasn't necessarily in the top 25, that you got a good education? Did you get a lot out of that school? Oh, yeah, it was excellent. And actually what I learned is that it's not the ranking that really makes a difference in terms of your education. I mean, there's a level of prestige that comes with saying that you went to Harvard or you went to Yale. Um, but in terms of education, I got a lot out of BU. And um, I actually had some of the same professors as Harvard because, you know, adjuncts, or maybe you don't know, but uh, some instructors aren't full-time, and when they're not full-time, they usually have to work at a few different colleges teaching a couple classes here, a couple classes there. And I had multiple instructors who were also teachers at Harvard and um, getting, you know, teaching the same exact class and getting the same education, and they were telling me how it was actually harder at BU because they weren't allowed to give everybody A's. You know, they had to have some A's and B's and C's. And because um, I was struggling to get an A in English, I really wanted an A and I kept getting B pluses. And he said, you know, you're doing a great job in another class you would have gotten an A, but unfortunately you're in a really smart class and there are just other people who are doing a little better and so I can't give you the A. So that part was unfortunate, but as you get older you realize grades don't mean anything anyway. It's really what you take out of the education. And so um, I'm really grateful to my education. So beyond just taking classes, were there any other things that you did during college that helped prepare you that you were involved in or got involved in that helped prepare you for this particular path that you went on working in the museum and so forth? Yeah, actually, so um, another nice thing about Boston and those major cities is they have a lot of museums. So I volunteered at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and I did an internship at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, which was amazing. And it really was the, um, the impetus for me to go into museum education. I had to make a difficult decision my senior year because um, I was very academically oriented, and I wanted to do my senior thesis. It wasn't required at BU. Um, but I figured I was an honors student and I wanted to have this as an accolade and I thought it would be a great thing for me to do. Um, but then I learned just how much I loved working in the museum and teaching. And at the Gardner Museum, they literally let me teach school groups, you know, I mean, not just walk around in shadow, but I was really teaching and designing um, lessons. So I was thinking, you know, which is more important for me in terms of my long-term education and ability to get a job, and the truth was that the work experience was more important. Mm -hmm. And that's something my first job at Auburn University, they told me the reason they chose me is because I had so many internships and, you know, uh, jobs related to art museums and education and so um, you know I I literally taught every age and even though I wasn't making any money that was a lot more valuable than just you know writing and presenting a paper even though I would have I would have liked to have had that on my diploma you know so what type of things did you teach back then when you were interning and so forth well um, primarily I was working with school-aged children 
And so I would take the students as a class around the museum, give them a tour, but it was specific to a topic, a theme. And so one might be, um, they all had to do with exercising critical thinking, learning how to look at something carefully and analyze it and get information from it. And so we might look at things that were from Asian countries, or we might look at things that were from uh, like specifically paintings of people or of scenes and go to four or five different paintings or four or five different art objects and I would facilitate discussions, you know, so what is it that you see here? And someone might see a picture of a storm and think, um, you know, it looks like it's really scary and noisy. And then I'd say, you know, what do you see that makes you say that? And they'd mention um, big waves and it's dark and, um, you know, the boat is on, is looks like it's sinking or it's on an angle. And so I'd get them, it's, easy sometimes for us to get an impression of something and not know where we got it from. And so getting the kids to really articulate, like, what is it that gives you this impression? And what do you see that makes you say that? And, um, and then we'd probably do an art project related, maybe listening to music and painting at the same time and painting what you're feeling, you know, when you hear that music. Uh, it was really fun. A lot of good. I, I, I enjoyed it just as much as the kids did, I think. <laughs> now, the t uh, if you had to put a title to that position, what what would be that title when you were doing that work? Specifically, so that's not the curator of education because they're more overseeing the department. Mm -hmm. They get to do tours once in a while to keep involved, but it's more a um, just a just a museum educator um, volunteer form is called a docent or a tour guide. Um, they even have that role in uh, living history museums like farms and old, um, you know, uh, what is it called? Old manors and estates from hundreds of years ago. Uh, so, and that would be like a tour guide as well. Now, you eventually became a curator? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. They also call them interpreters. Okay. Museum interpreters. Okay. So you did this volunteer work and then you graduated school. And when you graduated school, how soon after that did you land your first job doing this work? Well, so I graduated undergrad and went straight into graduate school for museum education. Okay. Not necessary, but it was really really great I enjoyed it you could get an education degree or other degrees and still get a job but um, there is value to having museum education if that's what you know you want to do um, I think I was hired in June and May was when I graduated so I didn't know that I had gotten the job at graduation um, I started interviewing in April but I knew it shortly after so and then I I asked him if I could start in August because I was supposed to have a vacation that summer that I didn't want to miss. So. <laughs> and where was that first job? In Boston area or no? No, that one was in uh, Auburn, Alabama at Auburn University. And that was the curator of education position. Is that where you went for your, uh, for your graduate degree? Graduate degree, I went to University of the Arts in Philadelphia. So okay. I started out in Boston, went over to Philly, and then down to Alabama. So how did you, after, when you, while you were in Philly, how did you make that connection to Alabama? Well, the museum world is small, and so they show you where to look for jobs, where the job postings are, and I found them, and I just applied to everything that looked relevant. And I had several job interviews, and um, a couple of them, you know, went a little further, and Auburn was the first one to say yes. And so I said yes. Um, now, did you, did you have to uh, fly f down for an interview initially, or did you talk to them on the phone first? Yeah, so um, all of the ones that I applied to had a phone interview first okay. with usually one person, and then um, they would fly you in for an in-person interview with a group. There was one museum, and I didn't get the job there, and I'm sure I could have if I would have fork the money over to fly over, but they couldn't afford to pay for my flight. Mm. Um, and then it's not really fair when you meet a bunch of people in person and then you have a phone interview with one candidate, you know, instead. Um, 
but that would have been a perfect perfect setup for me. It was an Asian art museum and I thought I wanted to get my PhD in Chinese history, I mean Chinese uh, painting for a while. So that would have been really neat. But um, I don't regret my path. I love the path I took. Um, but there, there is that. The negative to some museums is that they're underfunded and so they're always pinching pennies. Um, it's not a high paying position to work in most museums. Although the smaller the museum often the more they pay you because in larger museums like uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art you should just be happy that you have a job there you know with that label behind you because um, it means you could get a job anywhere else later the is smaller it, is museums that true? um is it true no I would say so if you did a good job yeah okay. um, the because it's like I said it's a small community and so you meet people and there's a lot of, um, I don't think nepotism is the right word when you're not related, but um, like I could have gotten a job pretty easily in the southeast in museums because I started to get involved in things like the museum conference in the southeast. I was a, a program, um, what is it called? I was on the programming committee and people knew me. Um, when I moved to Chicago, it was for my husband's job, and nobody knew me up here. And co like people right out of college had a better chance of getting a job uh, here in Chicago than I was, only because they knew the people already. You know, if you went to University of Chicago, which had a relationship with the Oriental Institute, which is their museum, or the um, Modern Art Museum here, they have an internship program with the University of Chicago. And they'd rather hire a student right out of school that went to that college because they know them and they want to support their growth than they would someone that they don't know from the other side of the country who might be very qualified, you know. So when you were, when you were in high school, uh, if, if there's somebody out there who is in high school and they're also looking to possibly do this, how important do you think it is for that high school student to start trying to do some internship stuff or some volunteer work at some, you know, museums maybe in their area before they even start trying to apply to a college? Um, before applying to college, I don't know that it is 100% critical. Okay. I did actually work at a museum in high school, though, um, now, now that I think about it, the Cole Children's Museum, which is a very different type of a museum, but it did help to have that um, on my resume showing that I already had interests. I mean, if, if a student knows that they might be interested in it, uh, it is nice to start in high school because a lot of them have special high school programs, a lot of museums do. Um, really offering opportunities to uh, experience different areas of the museum because you might realize that you love science and you want to work at a science museum but you didn't realize that you don't have to be an educator or a curator you could even do marketing but still work at a science museum you know you could do graphic design but you're designing the brochures and the media and material for a science museum uh, which is actually what my cousin does in Minnesota. So um, uh, it, it would be a really, I think it would be very informative and fun okay. to do that. And then when someone goes into college and they start, even if they don't necessarily declare their major in this field, um, but if they think that this is something they want to do, are there any clubs that you might recommend that they look at joining, courses that they should look at taking to help educate themselves, you know, in towards this direction? Yeah, I mean, it also depends on the subject matter of interest because I was art history, art museums was a perfect fit for me and I loved it, you know. Um, so art history courses were important. A lot of museums are okay with you knowing the subject matter very well and maybe not having quite as much teaching experience. But to me, that says that the teaching experience is what puts you above and beyond the other candidates because mm -hmm. everyone applying to the planetarium for an educator position has to have a master's or at least a bachelor's degree in astronomy. 
Um, but if you have that bachelor's or master's and you have some experience working in a planetarium already or teaching children or, or adults or whatever age you're going to be responsible for, that just puts you above and beyond. So um, college was a perfect time. You know, you don't have all the responsibilities that you will when you're out of college, right. uh, typically. So, you know, that would be a great place to work. Even if, um, if you have to work for a living, if you could even just work in the cafeteria in, in the museum that you're interested in, even if it's not directly teaching, but you're affiliated with a museum already, you'd be surprised how quickly an outgoing person or a motivated person could start to get to know the other departments and people in the museum making those connections. So what I'm hearing you say is if you end up getting a position at a museum that may not be the position that you really want, it's okay if you work it. Yeah, yeah. Let people know what your interests are and communicate with other people. Uh, because it's such a small field, people want to help you. And if they realize that you're an intern in the education department and you're, you know, putting together materials, but you really want to learn about being a curator, they'll probably, at the very least, they'll introduce you to the curator and you could have a meeting with them and learn more about their background and what it took to get there. So um, we like to help each other out. <laughs> so what exactly is a curator and what do they do? So when people say curator and not curator of education, uh, they're okay. referring to the person that is an expert in that um, scholarly field. So for art history, it's not even just art history. It's usually a specific area of art history like Chinese painting or Northern Renaissance um, painting or um, or Baroque sculpture, something very specific like that. And they usually have a PhD. Uh, some museums, you could get away with having just a master's, but um, they often expect that you'll be on your way to getting a PhD in that content area. Mm -hmm. And then what you're responsible for doing is putting together those exhibits that you see when you go to a museum. So for example, um, if you've ever gone to see a Van Gogh exhibit, which goes around the country, the, the curator who put that together picked out those particular paintings, mm -hmm. contacted, well, depending on how big the um, institution is, maybe they didn't contact them directly. Someone else might have done it, but um, they can be responsible for contacting the museums or the individuals that own those pieces, asking for the permission to use them in this exhibit. And um, writing all the information that you would see in the guides and on the walls, telling you about those pieces. And so they're basically coming up with the story or the topic or the message, whatever it is they're trying to communicate that um, is the central uh, core to that um, exhibit. So I saw one about Van Gogh and Gauguin and their friendship and, um, and their life. So they were telling the story of their lives and, you know, the ups and downs. And then they had paintings representing the different periods of their life. And you got to learn about the people while you're learning about the paintings. Um, and that's just one example. In a science museum, you know, it could be uh, something related to gravity and, um, and how gravity works. And so you're the one coming up with uh, all the content, all of the learning material that's on the walls and, you know, what kinds of activities you work with the curator of education to decide what kinds of activities and um, display should be there to communicate the idea of gravity. And the curator of education will probably come up with um, specific children's activities and family activities that go along with this larger piece. And the exhibit designers will um, literally construct whatever, um, whatever the exhibit will look like and the parts to it. But you're all working together and it's, it's the curator's idea that's sort of driving um, the direction, I would say. How many curators might work at a museum? Would it be one, or do they have different curators for different sections of 
a museum? So in a smaller museum like Auburn University's Art Museum where I worked, we had one curator and she would have to um, curate all of the exhibits that involved artwork from our museum. Sometimes we would get exhibits like traveling exhibits that someone else curated and then she would just be the liaison uh, bringing those exhibits over, getting them, help getting them set up. Uh, literally deciding where they go on the walls and if there's any additional material they want to provide at this at this museum um, related to that exhibit but then in a bigger museum like the Museum of Fine Arts Boston they they probably had 50 curators I mean 50. I don't know exactly but I know you need one for every area of art that they that's what I was thinking they have wow so and then how many different curator educators again at um, the small museum where I was we actually had two one for adult education and one for youth and family and schools that was me um, a lot of the smaller museums only have one and then they are also in charge of a volunteer corps of people that um, you know help teach but then at the larger museums they have one director of education but then maybe eight or ten people right below them like a like the person responsible for the schools and tours and then the person responsible for family programs and the one responsible for preschool programs and another for adult programs so you can have in a larger museum uh, eight or ten people that are very responsible for one area and then they can even have some people below them helping them out so, again, the education department at a larger museum could have 20 people in it. And the t a title for those type of people might be what? What, what, might, what kind of title would they have uh, as educators in these different areas? You like might have a manager of school programs or a coordinator of family programs. You know, it could be a manager, coordinator. Um, and again, the museum educator is a very broad term that's often applied. Okay, so there's different different educators for different types of areas as well. Right. Do you need to specialize in getting any special training for it? In other words, if you wanted to do family education, do you usually get a, get a uh, training? specializing in that or do people float around from one specialty to another can can you flip around you could flip around um, again when you're in a small museum you probably will be doing it all right, right. which is something that I loved because it meant um, every day was different and exciting right. um, if you did want to specialize then that's something where when you're deciding on where to intern or volunteer you express that interest and hopefully they'll put you in that area. Um, it really just requires work experience in that area. And if you do decide to get a graduate degree like I did, um, we were given projects where you work with a museum team, uh, the exhibition designers and the educators and the communications people, curators. You know, we all would work together for projects. and. Um, you could start to explore your area of interest there. So, for example, we did a mock exhibit. We developed the exhibit, even all the materials. It, it didn't actually happen. You know, we made a little model that was like, you know, that big um, with little bitty people that would walk through it, um, which was a lot of fun. But uh, in that case, you know, I decided that I was going to produce. Um, tour materials uh, that people could take around for um, a self-guided tour and that was one of those things where if I was more interested in adult programming I could have I could have said that I was going to be the person to create the event schedule for the adult programming um, and then you you have something to show in your portfolio and you have real experience to talk about when you're applying for jobs um, but I have to say one of the things that won over Auburn University for me 
was the fact that in grad school I had even more internships. So by the time I was applying for jobs, I think I had about seven different museum internships or mm -hmm. art internships. And um, I saved some of the work from a lot of them. So um, I made some children's activities, printable things that they could carry around the museum and you know they could draw something that they see or write about something that they see. And I saved some of the really cute ones and I put them in my portfolio and passed it around the table when we were having the interview. And they were just tickled by some of the things the kids wrote. But it was showing that what I had created was really resonating with the kids. Mm. And uh, that's what they want. They want people to be engaged and to love learning. I'm and ready to um, hire you. Huh? <laughs> I'm ready to hire you for our museum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Now, do you currently have a master's, a doctorate? Where are you currently? So currently I have a master's in museum education. The degree is really called museum studies, but as I chose the education path, I um, have graduate level work in education, just a plain education degree that if I continue to pursue it, it could allow me to teach in K through 12 public school. Um, that's something I was doing in the interim when um, I moved to Chicago without a job lined up during the recession, not the most brilliant move in the world, and um, had 15 part-time jobs and was getting that education to kind of open doors for me. But um, before I could finish, I got offered a full-time job at Harper College. And um, ultimately, like I told you, I didn't want to deal with the politics of a public school. So it was very attractive to take this job instead. Okay. So, um, your first job was, again, what was the title of the first job you had? Curator of Education. Curator of Education. And you did that for about how long? I did that for two years. I would have, I loved it, loved it. And I would have done it longer, but I was recruited out um, for my next job. And it was in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a bigger city and, for me, a, a better place to live. Uh, and that was to work w as a curator of collections, of exhibitions, with a company called Tinwood Media. And they had um, coordinated and put together the Quilts of G's Bend exhibit, which is, was this national phenomenon um, in the 2002 to 2000 seven era and uh, the quilts of G's Ben just as a summary is um, a show about quilts that were made by these African-American women from a teeny little town in Alabama they're very artistic you could hold them up next to uh, some of the most famous and expensive paintings in the world but those paintings were created by white men and these are fabric arts by black women and so you know the value to society is is different there's a lot of um, culture and politics and all sorts of things that go along with the story. But the long of short is uh, it was the very first exhibit I worked with at Auburn University and I made friends with a lot of the artists and they invited me to their daughter's weddings and you know and I would go there for vacation to this little little teeny town in, in Alabama and so the folks who created that exhibit invited me to help them with a book and I did book editing and, and uh, proofreading for them and they realized I'd be a good person to work with and so they hired me on full time so that I could curate um, exhibits for the quilts and for other um, African American folk art. So uh, if it wasn't for the fact that they enticed me with a life in Atlanta I would have stayed there longer. Um, so yeah. How did you make that connection that allowed for that, uh, you know, option to come into your life to go to Alabama, or yeah, to Alabama or Georgia. No, just back to Georgia, I mean. So um, basically, a lot of you'll find that a lot of things happen through networking and genuine networking. Not, I mean you could go around and meet people in the back of your mind thinking what are they going to do for me later in life you could do that and that works for some people um, personally I've always just you know I don't, and when I think someone's interesting or I admire somebody I don't hide it you know we don't get complimented enough in life <laughs> and so you know I tell people when I appreciate them and and you'd be surprised how many people really 
um, don't hear that very often and, and they want to be warm to someone who's warm back. And so um, I got that from communicating with the artists. I mean, part of your job at a museum is to be a liaison with the community and also the artists that come through. And so depending on your role, you have more or less involvement with that. At a large museum, you might not have as much communication directly with the artists unless you are the curator of exhibits. But at a smaller museum, you're really involved in everything. And so I was escorting them places and also the staff who had put together the exhibit and you have conversations with them and you learn about them. You do a lot of listening and um, and you express you know genuine interest and you stay in touch. That's the other thing. A lot of people use LinkedIn or Facebook and they make friends right away but they don't actually put any effort into um, building a relationship with them beyond just liking them. So, Explain to me if you can what you feel building a relationship would involve? Like, what did you do to build a relationship beyond just adding somebody to your Facebook or adding somebody to LinkedIn? How, how did you do that? Well, um, again, I think that the strongest um, way to build a relationship is to be genuine about it, really listening, finding what interests you about that person and um, what they have to share and asking questions, learning more. The more you know about the person that you're trying to connect with, uh, the more you can share with them too what would be relevant and interesting to them. Um, with the artists and with the Tinwood family, um, you know, the folks who worked at Tinwood, I think it was, um, again, being showing them that I'm truly interested. I offered to help them with things. You know, when I found out that they had a book that they were trying to get done and they're hitting their deadline, you know, I said, you know, if there's anything I can do, uh, let me know. And they took me up on it, you know, <laughs> and I did a really great job. So, um, you know, and even if they hadn't, I can't remember if they asked me right away about the book, but um, maybe I offered, oh, I know what it was. I took a, a whole group of the kids from G's Bend over to uh, see their exhibit in Auburn. Like I got funding together because I figured nobody had invited the children of these artists to come see their work in a real museum. So I put together a grant and I got them over to the museum and gave them school tours and I went over to the community. You know, I think it's just a lot of reaching out, showing people that you're willing to do for them before you're even thinking about what they could do for you. And I think it's one of those paying it forward things that really motivates good people to help others, you know. Um, it's worked for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely am hearing from you a lot more than just adding somebody to Facebook and, you know, putting up on Facebook, here's what I uh, did with my dog this weekend and thinking that that's how you're maintaining a relationship with the people um i hear right. a lot more in you know uh, a personal tr you know reaching out and trying to do bigger things yeah like for example right now so i mentioned that one of my jobs right now is web development and marketing okay. and so one of the things i do for that job is every day i'm reviewing um all of the publicity calls you know, all of the um, uh, media outlets that are asking for people who are experts in this or experts in that. And I'm doing it specifically for myself and my clients. But if I notice something that I think a friend of mine, you know, from a different walk of life might value or might be a good expert. Or just today I saw something about um, painting expert. You know, why would you hire a professional painter instead of do it yourself? What is one of those situations? And I know of a professional painter, um, and so I'm going to forward that over to him. And then, you know, that, that could be an opportunity for publicity. It might get him more work. Who knows? But I think it's that kind of um, going above and beyond for people when you don't need to. And it doesn't take much for me to do that because I'm scanning through these things anyway. Uh, but thinking of other people and putting that out there um, is helpful to them and then when you start doing good things for people, it's amazing how it comes back to you, you know. Okay. Um, so 
you went to Georgia. Are you still in Georgia now? No. So um, I you met gotta, my. You have to apologize that I'm. I have a, a tough time <laughs> putting A to B to C. So I, I apologize. But uh, so you were in Georgia, and then where did you go after that? So yeah, I went from Chicago to Boston to um, a semester abroad in Florence, Italy, and then to Philadelphia, then to Alabama, and then to Georgia, and now I'm back in Chicago. I need a and, map. Huh? I need a little road map here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I moved from Atlanta to Chicago because uh, for my husband's career, whom I told you would be great to interview, he decided to go from... Um, being a professional chef to IT, having a day job, you know, rather than a night job. And he's now a stone sculptor. And there are very few of those. So we had to move to where he could pursue that career. So that's how I ended up leaving Georgia um, and my jobs there to coming to Chicago. And like I said, I had 15 jobs. I mean, one of the things that I would encourage any young person is just um, – get as much experience in the areas of interest as you can, whether you're working for free or you're being paid, uh, because it opens doors for you. And don't be afraid to take jobs that aren't exactly what you want. You know, if um, I have family members that in the recession got laid off and they went without work for a couple of years because they felt like they had to do that one thing that they had been doing before and making that same salary that they had been doing before. And mind you, when I left my job in Atlanta and I was making for for my um, field, you know, a pretty good salary. I'll be open because kids probably want to know what they could make. Um, I, huh? Well, the thing is, I mean, they will, but it depends on what year they might be listening to this. So in other oh, words, that's true. It, but it's okay. It, let's just say that it's 2013 now. So yeah. we can draw a, you know, a line to that. So what were you making then? So first, in 2005, when I was in grad school, I was told that a museum educator should make at least 35000 starting out with a master's. That's still low, um, but that is what, what we at least should be making or we should fight for. Um, of course, like I said, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art or those larger institutions, they were some of them started out at 25000 because, again, they felt like you should just be happy to have a job here. Wow. And other smaller museums would start people at 40 or higher. Mm. Um, the, the job that I had in Atlanta started me at 46, which was pretty good. Um, so that was over $10,000 difference in just a couple years. So that was one of those places that, you know, appreciated your work, you know, financially a little bit more. Um, the larger museums, the um, director of education might make fifty or sixty or seventy thousand uh, dollars. At some of the large museums, like the Illinois Holocaust Museum, for example, I think they make close to six figures. The director of education, if they don't make six figures, um, so it really depends. There's a range. Um, a museum educator could get up to sixty thousand. Uh, without being a director of education, but that that's a long road to climb, you know. Um, so you could start where I did and still even get up to six figures if you're if you're um, specifically looking for that and you pursue that kind of path, those museums and such. Now, when you and I think over... science museums pay more oh, really? than um, art art or history museums. When you went overseas, mm -hmm. was that to work or was that just for pleasure or what was that? Oh, that was study abroad during oh. uh, uh, college. For, Did that help um, you? Was that a history. good thing to do? Do you, you know, recommend that? Oh, definitely. I mean, I don't know for a fact that it helped me get a job. I don't know if they saw that and thought that makes her a better candidate, mm -hmm. but it makes you more worldly. It... Um, it, at least for me with art history, it really put in context the art that I was claiming to know about. Um, and I think just, you know, experiencing other cultures and how different countries work, you know, that's just an important life skill. And I think it comes across 
you know, without you having to say anything when, when you do have some sense of other cultures. So. Okay. So what was your next job out of 15 <laughs> that you oh. kind of went through? Um, cause I'm, I'm just trying to give someone an idea of the different types of things that they could look to do. And in order to find that, passion thing that they want to maybe stay with at least for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, so what was the so next thing? The nice thing about, again, the museum education degree and the areas that I went into is these are very transferable skills. Mm. And so as long as you can see that as the person with the skills, you can communicate that to other people. Because nobody knows what a museum education degree is, you know. No one hired me because of that degree except for the museums. So, um, let's see. When I came to Chicago, I was doing nonprofit um, consulting, helping them fill out their paperwork to become a nonprofit and stay a nonprofit. And I learned how to do that by attending workshops in that area. There's a place called Donors Forum in Chicago, and I'm sure they have them across the country, where you could learn about you know, how to run a nonprofit. And having been in nonprofits, you know, museums are nonprofits, that helped a lot seeing how things were run. Um, I was tutoring a lot of students. In and what? Um, in what? One was sixth grade science and math, another was um, uh, first grade, actually, reading and writing. It's amazing how school has become so hard that first graders need tutors nowadays. Um, I was mentoring a high school student who had um, learning disabilities. And I was, um, mind you, museum education is still an education degree. So you, you learn a lot about how the brain develops. And um, that doesn't necessarily qualify you to teach people with learning disabilities. But um, I did a lot of extra research, you know, did a lot of extra learning. And um, were these what else activities did I do? things that you did, like a, you donated your time or were you paid for this work? Uh, these were all paid positions. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I could, unfortunately, in that period of time with 15 jobs, I couldn't afford <laughs> a non paid position. I was teaching Sunday school and. Um, things like Sunday school and foreign language at a few different places. Um, and I was working on a farm, a 1930s living history farm as a, as a heritage interpreter. That, that is a museum job, even though it's at a farm because you're teaching people about history and life in a different period of time. I just happened to be wearing the same thing as Rosie the Riveter. So, um, well, I did it in feeding cows and, you know, chickens and things like that. That was actually the best job I've ever had. It's just too bad that that does not pay money. <laughs> that really doesn't. Um, although, if you're a manager of the farm, that pays well enough, you know. So if it's something, if students are interested in teaching but in an alternate environment, museum education could get you a job in a zoo in a living history museum, like a farm museum or um, a heritage home. So, and it is a lot of fun. It's not always about the money, you know. What would you say is the thing that you love most out of every, you know, in this whole picture? What is it that you love doing? And I'm guessing you're gonna say something to do with teaching, but what what is the thing that you love doing that's the constant theme through all these different jobs? Well, you're right. It is teaching, but specifically connecting with individuals and seeing individuals, literally seeing them grow before your eyes. I mean, when I was working at that farm, I got to teach kids how to use um, one of those old style uh, washer and dryers, which was really just a, um, a washboard and a roller you know, and so um, kids would be cleaning my uniform, which had cow poop all over it, you know, and they were just having the greatest time. 
but they're discovering, you know, there's, <laughs> I know, <laughs> can I clean that? Well, if your mom says so, then I guess, yeah, you could shovel the cow poop out of the barn. All right. You don't have to get in my car afterwards. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, just seeing that light bulb go off over people's heads and it's not just children. I mean, I've taught adults that too. Um, even in my job right now at the college, I'll teach instructors how to teach online and how to use technology and, and you see a light bulb go on over their head when they realize, oh, I can use this to make my class better, you know, and to make it more interesting to the students. And um, so it's not limited to an age. It's one of those things where you see someone growing and it's just, it's amazing. It's a great feeling to know that you've had that positive impact. And even with the marketing and the web design, um, when you work directly with clients, it can be education. You can just do a project, do what they ask you to, take their money and you're done. Um, but you could also give them advice on, you know, why something might be a better choice and um, what might be helpful to their business to help them grow. And people, when they realize you're really there to help first and getting paid is just how you eat <laughs> at the end of the day, um, they appreciate that and they, they trust you. So um, in all those cases, I get to work with people like that and mentor and teach and learn with them. So let's say we got someone in high school who's trying to just figure out what the heck they want to be. What type of indications, um, if somebody is trying to figure out what they want to be, what would, what would they see in themselves that would say, that you would say, you might be good at this? What would that be? Um, well, probably someone who does love school or if they don't love school but they love learning things because, you know, there are lots of people who could care less about their grades on a test but um, will be reading something, you know, when they get home. They can't wait to finish that book about, you know, how things work or can't wait to surf the internet to see how to put something together, how to create something. So, um, someone who's very passionate about learning in whatever form that is, but then also sharing it afterwards. So if, if you've created something and you can't wait to show your parents or show your girlfriend or, you know, share that with somebody and explain it to somebody, um, that's probably a good bet because that's a lot of what you have to do in all of these education type positions is um, take information and, and articulate it in a way that makes somebody else you know, learn something from it, want to wanna hear what you have to say. And um, I think someone, I used to be very shy, so I don't think that you have to be an outgoing person to do these things um, by nature. It's something you could learn. You get very comfortable very quickly when you have to stand in front of a group of 30 or 50 kids on a regular basis. And once you're comfortable in front of the kids, standing in front of a bunch of adults is they're just big kids usually. <laughs> so um, so I don't think you have to already feel comfortable with public speaking for a lot of these, but um, you will develop that. Uh, you could be like the curator of education doesn't have to be in front of the public. You know, it can be more of an administrative role. Um, but still, to get to that point, you'll, you'll have wanted to climb the ladder because the most fun parts are, you know, when you're on the floor giving people tours and, and working with individuals. So um, that would still help. But the desire to keep learning throughout your whole life, I would say, and then share that. Because the other thing is with any of these jobs, you're not going to be that good at it if you stop learning when you're done with school. Because all these fields are constantly evolving. The um, technology that's even a part of museums is constantly evolving. The, um, the way people learn, we, we're learning more about that. And so you want to um, always be on top of those studies so that you can engage with people in the ways that will be most effective and exciting and interesting to them. Are there any little secrets, any tips any thoughts or anything that you might want to share with someone who, again, is 
maybe thinking they might want to pursue looking into this as something they want to do um, that maybe they wouldn't know without you telling them things that might, whatever? Um, sometimes it's hard to figure out how to get involved in the museum. Don't be afraid to look on their website for email addresses, phone numbers, and call and ask for a curator of education or, you know, whatever role it is that you're interested in, or just emailing and saying, I'm a student who wants to learn more about what a curator does. Can I interview you? Um, or can you connect me with a person that can help me? Because some of those emails just go to, you know, um, a front desk or something like that. Uh, but don't be afraid to reach out because it usually is um, more powerful of a tool than one might imagine. These people in the museums are busy, but not that many people are reaching out in that way. And I know that um, someone reached out to me, and we're still in touch. She, she was in college at the time. I was working at Auburn University's Art Museum, and she was doing a project on the quilts of G's Bend, and I ended up taking her over to G's Bend. Not everybody would take someone over, but they would at least talk to them on the phone and give them as much direction as they could. So um, don't feel like if you can't find someone's name, direct name and number on the website that you, you need to stop there, you know. Um, but usually the message will get through to the person that it needs to if you just hunt around a little bit. And uh, even if you go to the museum and you stop at the front desk and you say, I really like this place, do you happen to know if there are any internships or volunteer opportunities available and they usually have a brochure or something they could give you with information um, so okay and in picking out a college to go to are there any bits of advice that you might have as far as what someone might want to look for in a college or university can they get started at a two-year school as opposed to jumping right to a four-year university or and, and what type of things should the university maybe have available um, what type maybe what type of courses what type of other things anything like that yeah you know um, museum education is a small area a graduate degree is a terminal degree there is no PhD at least at this time for museum education or museum studies so you may not find a school that has museum studies there. Um, but, you know, if you are in a bigger city that has museums, then you're probably in a good spot. Um, there will probably be people at your institution that have relationships with some of the museums. You know, so if it's science, you could talk to the, the head of the science departments, the biology or, you know, chemistry departments, see if there are any connections to the museums, if you're, you know, if you're trying to decide that if that's the college to go to, if you know you're interested in history or, or art, you know, you can see if they have connections. Because um, especially, you can start at a two-year institution. I mean, working at one right now, I realize how valuable, I wish I knew how valuable two-year institutions were when I was in school. I mean, the education here is phenomenal. Um, so it's not like, you know, a school you go to if you can't get anywhere else. That's okay. not it at all. Good. Um, so, so that's perfectly fine, but it is typically the bigger institutions that have the relationships with, with other big institutions like museums. So for Boston University, our um, PhD art history program had opportunities at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston for those candidates to give tours and teach and do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So Boston University does have a connection with the museum. You know, that's the kind of thing where you, you can investigate if you know what department you might want to go into, asking them those questions when you're shopping around for colleges. And, um, and but basically, if, if there are a few museums in your area, the area of your college, then that's pretty good. You badger them enough and you'll, you'll be able to get an internship or a volunteer position. That I think like it took tip. me. Uh, hmm? I said that sounds like a good tip. Yeah, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston didn't respond to me the first time I asked to volunteer, um, but then I 
I literally went there. I showed up at a, at a family volunteer activity and I talked to people and I said, who could I talk to about volunteering here? And the person was there and they said they hadn't gotten my my inquiry. So who knows? Um, but it's hard to deny when a person walks right up to you that they're interested. And that's how I got to volunteer there. Well, that's great. Um, I think this has been fabulous. And I think the information you shared uh, will go a long way to helping a lot of uh, people try who might be considering this for themselves. Um, do you have any final thoughts or any other words that you wanted to share? Because aside from that, I think we did great. Yeah, you know, I guess um, to really think about all of your interests, because there are ways, you know, if you work it right, to incorporate multiple interests. Because, for example, you might be a computer person, and you might feel like, oh, you know, what could I possibly do at a museum if I like programming? But, again, you know, somebody needs to work on the website for a museum, and um, somebody needs to develop... Um, they actually, a lot of museums now have computer kiosks where you can look at objects or artwork or whatever the case may be from different angles or different countries. You know, maybe it's so you could learn about the conservation process, you know, things that aren't that conducive to being in the actual space. And so, you know, there are lots of areas that you could go into and still work in a museum, which means that you get to go to the museum for free and go to exhibits for free and, and be involved with it. So um, that was one of the best perks of working at the Gardner Museum for me was I would put on my running clothes and on the weekends when I wanted to go over there, I could just get in for free and take a walk around and it was so beautiful. But, um, you know, really... Uh, learn about what your interests are and ask a lot of questions because there probably is a place for you if you want to be at a museum but you don't want to necessarily be an educator at the museum or be the curator you know so there's other things that sounds great well Stephanie thank you very much for today and uh, we will have your information up on the website and uh, links to different places and things if people wanted to contact you. Are you open if anybody had any questions to reach out to you? Would that be okay? Oh, absolutely. Sure. All right. Well, terrific. Well, thank you very much again. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.